it shouldn't have been quite so extraordinary. We were looking at these galaxies because they are the largest galaxies and we expected to find the largest black holes. So you might think of these as cannibal galaxies that have eaten a lot of other galaxies, including the black holes that uh, existed at the center, center of these uh, food <laughs> items. As the galaxy gets bigger, the black hole at the center gets bigger as well. These are the galaxies that we believe have formed from mergers and agglomerations of multiple smaller galaxies. They're at the very centers of large galaxy clusters. And we're singling out in these groups the most luminous galaxy. I think it was, I think it was a pretty direct open question. We simply wanted to know how big these black holes were. I'm James Graham. I'm director of the Dunlap Institute and also a professor of astronomy at the University of Toronto. Nicholas McConnell. I'm a PhD student at UC Berkeley. Uh, and I've been working closely with James Graham at the Dunlop Institute and Chung Pei Ma at UC Berkeley. We ended up uh, discovering Guinness Book of Record uh, black holes. The most massive black holes uh, that anyone has discovered in our local universe. So, so if, we, if we zoom way, way out and now instead of looking at galaxies in our own neighborhood near the Milky Way, think about galaxies very, very far away um, that we observe as they were early on in the universe. There are a population of extraordinary objects known as the quasars, which are the most luminous objects in, in the universe. A quasar is a black hole that is uh, violently consuming a lot of gas. Very massive black holes accreting matter. Uh, and as the gas spirals in towards the black hole, it glows very, very bright. The bigger the mass of the black hole, the more energy is released when matter falls in. We can see it across the universe. And only with very massive black holes approaching a billion, or now we know in excess of a billion solar masses, can, can you generate so much luminosity? But quasars seem to be much, much more common earlier in the universe, and we see many of them further away relative to the handful that are somewhat nearby. In a sense, what we're doing forensic work, trying to study nearby examples of the, the ashes of the, the quasar by finding the black hole and, and measuring its mass now. If they existed back then, then they must exist somewhere in our universe now. The current black holes are, in a sense, quiescent. At some point, a black hole will run out of gas uh, and will live quietly until we use things like orbiting stars to detect that the black hole is actually there. So, of course, uh, as the name suggests, black holes are, are hard to see. We do not actually see the black holes. We don't see a black point in space. In fact, uh, the definition of a black hole is an object that has sufficiently strong gravitational field that not even light can escape from it. Uh, the best pr example, probably, of a black hole is one at the center of the Milky Way galaxy um, that we actually know quite intimately. And the evidence that we have for its presence is based on watching individual stars orbit around the black hole. What we do see is the effect that black holes' gravity have on nearby stars and sometimes nearby gas. And so that's a rather tedious process that requires that you come back every year and measure the new position of the star. Um, and so stars near a black hole will orbit um, in circles around the black hole and will orbit really quickly. Not, not only do stars moving around a black hole tell us that the black hole is there in the first place, but the precise speeds of the stars tell us exactly how massive the black hole is. So uh, you might say we have attention deficit disorder. And uh, so what we're doing is measuring the, the speed of stars, so not uh, on subsequent nights measuring the position, but actually at, a, at an instant measuring the velocities and looking at the velocities of many thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of stars. Um, so we use the motions of stars to get uh, a good precise measurement of just how massive and how large the black hole is. We didn't expect to find such large masses. The ones that we measured uh, were even more massive than our expectations. Masses approaching 10 billion solar masses, so that's thousands of times more massive than the black hole in our own Milky Way galaxy, and perhaps a factor of two or three more massive than the previous record holders. There, there's indirect evidence that galaxies and black holes grow together, um, and influence each other as the two are growing. The growth of the black hole and the growth of the galaxy itself were somehow, in some mysterious fashion, coupled together. Not every galaxy has a black hole in it, but there are sort of two different kinds of galaxies. The types of galaxies that we're looking at are not like our own Milky Way galaxy. That is uh, spread out like a disk. Which has spiral arms, and there's active star formation in, in the arms. The other kind of galaxy, which tend to be larger, are elliptical galaxies. We're looking 
at what you might think of as old red dead galaxies. And in most elliptical galaxies, new stars are not forming anymore. Their shape is more akin to a football. Or a rugby. You know, foot in Canada is a football, a soccer ball. is a football, a football. Unlike our galaxy, they're not flattened. In our nearby universe, there's about 65 galaxies that we know have black holes at their centers. Some spiral galaxies, in addition to having the disk of blue stars, also have a bulge um, that looks sort of like a small elliptical galaxy at the center of the spiral. Uh, our Milky Way galaxy has a disk and a bulge. Um, and specifically, in the spiral galaxies with these bulges, we also find black holes in every one that we've checked. I guess there are large elliptical galaxies and small elliptical galaxies, uh, and at all sizes, as long as there's something elliptical uh, about the galaxy, then where we've checked for a black hole, we found one. The, the galaxies in this particular study were chosen because they're the most luminous galaxies. They're the most stars of any galaxies in their host cluster. Um, so based on uh, elliptical galaxies that aren't quite as big, you can make a comparison between the black hole mass and the size of the galaxy or the brightness of the galaxy uh, and use that to predict how massive black holes should be in other elliptical galaxies. They should have been maybe a factor of two smaller. It probably does tell us something very interesting about them. Somehow the, the fact of building the black hole and creating a luminous quasar also affects the properties of, of the resultant galaxy. Um, and we wonder if galaxies and clusters have different relationships from galaxies in other parts of the universe. To grow a, a 10 billion solar mass black hole, you of course have to accrete 10 billion solar masses of a material that's gas, and, that's a lot of gas and stars. And so in the process, huge amounts of energy are, are released. And so this object was absolutely, almost with, with complete certainty, a very luminous quasar in the, in the distant past. So that, that's quite unambiguous. We knew that in the very early universe, 10 billion solar mass black holes probably did exist. Uh, and over time, these black holes would have either stayed the same mass or gotten bigger. Only in the, in the distant past, where galaxies were closer together, merger rates were, were more vigorous, is the fueling of the central black hole and its rate of growth sufficiently fast to make a luminous quasar. We're looking at, at quasars that are a thousand billion, so it's a, a million million times more luminous than the sun. One of the interesting things about the study was the combination of observations from different observatories that allowed us to probe a broad range of scales in the galaxy that hosts the black hole. So we're using a special technique called adaptive optics at the Keck Observatory to observe the very central regions of these galaxies. That's the, the tiniest scales on the, on the sky that allow us to see the stars that orbit most closely to the black hole on Intermediate scales, we're using the Gemini Observatory, and again, a, a novel technique called integral field spectroscopy that records the spectrum of every pixel in the field of view. And then we're using a new instrument at the McDonald Observatory, which uh, allows us to extend this technique across very wide areas that reaches out into the extreme halo of the galaxy, where stars are thinning out and the brightness of the light from those stars is correspondingly dim. Uh, we have data of how stars are moving in similar galaxies, uh, and we're also looking at that and hoping to find black holes that may be just as large as the ones that we found recently. This is part of a, a broader program to study the relationship between galaxy properties and, and their central black holes. It's not entirely clear yet what the details are and what the processes are that cause a galaxy and a black hole to grow and later cause them to stop growing.